it's Dan Schinder here on Yes Shift. And this is Stephen Schinder. We are a father-son podcast, you know, working the Yes Shift, talking about other different shifts in history and everyone who's been involved in Yes. Uh, and well, maybe, maybe not everyone, but... You, you eventually know. we will. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a very special episode. This is part of our series that we're doing not all in a row but intermittently about yes members first solo albums that came out since they joined yes some of them had albums out before they joined yes we're focusing on the first album since yes to see how being in yes might have affected their own first solo album that came out after they joined yes or how their own Shining shines through in Yes Music, and today we're featuring Steve Fish Out of Water by Chris Squire. Absolutely, his, yeah, his first solo album out of like two solo albums he ever put out. <laughs> out of both of them, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so this one came out November 7th, 1975, so just a week after Steve Howe's Beginnings album. Um, the two of them even appeared together for an interview on the old Grey Whistle test back around that time to promote both albums. I forgot was- about that. I've seen that. And I totally forgot about that till you just mentioned it. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. I think it's interesting that they came out a week apart. Yeah, I wonder what that was all about. Um, well, well, they're two different labels, right? I believe they're both Atlantic because I, I was watching the interview that Chris did with John Kirkman that was on the 2007 re-release of Fish Out of Water. And he said that it was kind of odd that Atlantic Records wasn't as happy about the solo albums idea and were like not as we're not promoting the solo albums as much. Like for the way it sounded was like maybe they didn't want the solo stuff to be too successful and make the members think oh we could put off yes and do all this stuff because like you know atlantic yes was very much one of their crown jewels and so you could imagine they probably didn't want to risk anything that would disrupt that flow you know putting out so many studio albums like hit after hit at that time you know what's interesting about that to me and I have this album on vinyl. I got it maybe a year after it came out. It's back there in a cabinet. I should have dug it out. But what's interesting about that to me is why would they care? Number one, if, let's just say if those two albums blew up or any of them and were extremely successful, that's a win for them. And it would be even a double win because it would cause people to buy more Yes albums. So I, I don't I don't know. As a professional marketer, I don't get that. But I guess back then things were just looked at in more of a, like you say, crown jewel kind of way. Like they don't want to tarnish this. This big thing is working so good. And this is back when they were playing stadiums and arenas and had truckloads of money and flew around in their own jets. And, you know, things were different. Maybe they were afraid that they would just kind of break that mold or something. Yeah, maybe. And Chris talked about how this album was recorded, like he recorded it for three weeks starting in March of that year. And then Yes went on tour and then he spent another three weeks and then more performing and then a few weeks again. And so, yeah, he kind of did this in between stuff. So kind of a busy schedule. And what's cool about that, it it does not sound pieced together. He did it all at his home studio and it doesn't sound at all like you'd never know. It's totally congruent and consistent, which is really cool. Um, where does this rank for you, Steve? And, and folks, chime in. Answer the same questions that Steve and I ask each other. We don't talk about this stuff before we do the show. It's not rehearsed. These are just natural, organic conversations. Be part of that. Steve's got the Drum Talk TV Facebook page up as well as, of course, our Yes Shift episode so that you live so that you can chime in and he'll read some comments but steve and everybody where does this rank for you for yes solo albums period not not just that came out once they were in yes but in the whole ranking no 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 let me back up let's say just since they joined (laughs) yes yeah (laughs) it's 
so far this is i would say definitely my favorite out of the ones we've talked about um what's kind of interesting is with stuff like beginnings or two sides of peter banks i was excited to revisit those after so long because i was like oh i don't have these ones as memorized so it's gonna be very adventurous but fish out of water is like a different type of excitement it's it feels like coming home you know this along with other stuff like elias of sun hillo or trevor rapin's can't look away i'm so intimately familiar with the music that it really does feel like coming home and like getting cozy and listening to it again but with the added dimension of having to think about okay what am i gonna pay attention to this time for the show so fish out of water is definitely my favorite of these ones so far i would say cool for me it's really difficult it's really difficult because this is the second one that i bought the first being beginnings and beginnings really took me by surprise i didn't know what to expect and folks if you don't know we covered that one already you can look back in our catalog and find that whether you're listening to us on anchor.fm slash yes shift or watching us on facebook.com slash yes shift but we covered that one and that one surprised me i love 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 it um i love this too but they are have a completely different feeling for me i think the win of fish out of water over beginnings is that in fish out of water for the most part through yes we've heard chris's playing but what we hear more of here is more of his composition work coming through but i think even more important and more prevalent for me his voice i've always loved yeah. Chris Squire's voice and to hear him way out front, not just in bits and pieces for the bridge or a, a chorus, but to be way out front for the whole thing, it, it's worth it just for that. You know, if someone said, hey, did you, idiot, did you know that everyone else are different musicians, including the bass player? I'd say, that's okay. I still just love this for his voice, <laughs> you know, and, and his lyric writing as well. Yeah. And but the wait, I got to say one more thing. Here's the other yeah. thing is that he helped foster a career that Steve Howe broke on his first album, and that's Bill Bruford on drums. Yeah. <laughs> like he brought Bill Bruford and Patrick Moraz. Yeah. And, and I'm his. kidding. Of course, Bill was already a legend, and we had Bill Bruford on the show. Maybe that's been three weeks or a month ago. Look for yeah, that. Yeah, almost a month. I yeah. Think. Yeah. So that that's cool, and and Patrick's work is great on it. There's some other great musicians as well. Uh, we'll go through all of that, but chime in, folks. Let us know where Fish Out of Water sits for you. Um, I, I was always so I was pretty young when I got this. I was probably 13 when I got it, and the two cover photos always intrigued me. You got him behind that gate to his house that is shaped like fish scales like wrought iron i guess or cast iron in the shape of fish fish scales and oh, then the so it's actually um well are you talking about the front cover or yeah oh so in the interview he says that um he was like getting in an elevator at a hotel oh really it's like the metalwork uh, of the elevator and brian lane you know yes manager at the time snapped a photo and it just was a miracle that it looked perfectly symmetrical. <laughs> yeah, it looks like fish scales. I always thought that was like the front gate to his front door uh, for some reason. I don't know. Or maybe I heard that way back then. And shot on a old Polaroid, <laughs> no doubt, as well, which is crazy that it works. But then I also love the other photo on the back where it's the reflection of a domed hubcap, chrome hubcap, and the backwards reflection of him playing an acoustic guitar. Uh, yeah, and there's like a stained glass thing on the back, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, my first exposure to any of this music was through the Yes Years documentary. They, they spent a little bit of time talking about the solo stuff of this period and included a snippet of that 
old Grey Whistle Test promo video with um, Chris and the orchestra and Bill and Patrick and right. it, it's and it's a bit of the documentary that I forgot for a while until I really got into like all the stuff that was on YouTube like in 2007 or so and they cleaned it up to look a bit nicer for the 2007 re-release and it's like really cool to see like I'm imagine that a yes fan at the time would be able to recognize Bill and Patrick and that must have been cool and the orchestra in that video at least was called the or maybe they're also on the recording I don't know but it, it credited them as the Piscean Symphony Orchestra which you know, lines well with Chris being a Pisces. Exactly. And of course, Chris, total classic Chris Squire uh, stage clothes, you know, with the yeah. chiffon wings and, you know, it's just, it's in the boots. It's perfect. It's just so Chris. Yeah, he, he gets really, he, he really goes all out with the outfits. It's just so him. And again, great to hear him on lead vocals and, uh, so the track list is very easy to get through. Uh, on side one, we have Hold Out Your Hand, You By My Side, Silently Falling. And on side two, we have Lucky Seven and Safe. In parentheses, it says Canon Song. And of course, Hold Out Your Hand and You By My Side are in that promo video. And they always feel like one continuous song to me. Like yeah. if I listen to one without the other, it just feels wrong to me it's like long distance run around like the fragile version without the fish yeah or future after. times and rejoice separately it just doesn't make sense yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah um and and steve found something today i never knew about and that is in the beginning of the relayer tour for the first 10 shows they actually played hold out your hand and silently falling and well, he found the 1976 tour yeah. oh 76 okay and he found um, audio recordings of them that aren't good enough to play right now because the, they just won't translate well. But Steve, maybe you could drop the links in the comments, maybe put both in one comment and pin it because they're worth a listen because uh, I never knew about that. Yes, playing Chris's music solo, solo music, never had a clue. Yeah, like they played both those opening tracks and you can kind of hear John um, singing vocal harmonies, uh, Yeah, at least in the beginning of one well, of them. But yeah, the audio isn't that great, but it's at least nice to see proof of it, I guess. And you imagine Alan White having joined the band for the Close to the Edge tour, then got to record, contribute to the writing and tour the Tales from Topographic Oceans tour, then contribute to the writing, record, and tour relayer. But then they spring this on him. He must be like, oh, I got to learn this other drummer's music again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we've talked before. Um, when we had Bill on the show, he said it was something along the lines of how it was kind of liberating, like not having to worry about, you, you know, it, he was working for Chris's material on that instead of like, working in a band yeah just show up and and play do his thing yeah yeah and uh, i was gonna ask this later but i guess i'll ask it now since you brought it up do you think the album would have been very different if chris had gotten alan to do all the drums instead i do and here's why even if all those drum parts were charted out and played note for note the way Bill recorded them, I still think it would sound different just because Alan's drum sound and feel is so different. The math is one thing. Putting the notes in those placements is one thing. That's the math. But the feel and the sound of the drums, the sonic qualities, Bill has such a signature that I, I think it would sound totally different. I think with Bill playing, and I don't, I don't of course mean that Alan is sloppy, but with Bill playing with his sound, it's more refined and it's, it leaves more space for 
Chris's bass and voice to shine through, whereas Alan has a bit, I guess, of a girthy, wider sound. Does that make sense? Yeah, I know what you're saying. Okay. Uh, That's a good question. What do you think? Yeah, I do think it would have sounded at least slightly different since their approaches are different. Like you said, even if the stuff was charted out, I think it would have had a different feel. Uh, and I'm not sure how drastic that difference would be. But I it do. Would definitely be different. I, here's, an, here's how one could kind of imagine. If you listen to Steve Howe's album, he has both Alan and Bill playing on different songs. And you can clearly, and another drummer uh, who I thought was Alan for a long time. Uh, Leahy, am I right? Brian Leahy? Is that um, who it is? I'll look that up. Okay. Little... But, but you clearly can hear the difference in the sound of the way those songs sound, even though it's still Steve. Uh, Dave Oberlay. Ah, that's right. Yeah, and Dave sounds... I, I for years thought it was Alan and forgot because I read the credits over and over when I got the album 133 years ago. But uh, <laughs> he sounds just like Alan. The sound. Remember, I even joked when we were or suggested when we were talking about the album that maybe he came to the studio to visit and nothing was going on. And Steve said, hey, do you want to play some drums? They're set up because they sound like Alan's drums. They they're sound yeah. like they're mic'd the same and everything. Yeah. And Patrick has some great moments, too. Chris had nice things to say about the Hammond solo on Silently Falling. And that song sounds the most yes to me out of these songs because of all the different changes it goes through. There's so much going on yeah. at once. Feels very sound chaser in places, which makes sense because they just did Relayer the year before. One of the You're right. And one of the things that stands out for me that I also am happy it's the opening song is Barry Rose's pipe organ playing on the opening track. That That's just such a great way to just kick the doors open and here's the album, you know? It's just the pipe organ, such a grand sound. And that was yeah. pipe organ with Yes Related Music before Awaken, before Rick. So I wonder how much influence Chris had on saying, hey, can we record that part on a church organ? Because that's what they ended up doing. Yeah, there are a bunch of interesting people here. We also got Mel Collins, who did tenor saxophone on a couple tracks. Um, Andrew Price Jackman is, I would say, oh, oh, we also got Jimmy Hastings on flute on the second track. But Andrew Price Jackman, I would say, was very, like he made huge contributions to some of the sound of this album. So he did acoustic and electric panos as well as orchestration. And for those who don't know, um, Jackman was in the sin with Chris before Yes was formed, but he later did the orchestration for Onward. So, you know, there's that rapport. And um, yeah, basically Chris just using all of these connections. And we even got his wife at the time, Nikki, doing backing vocals yeah. on Hold Out Your Hand. You know, I have, so up on my shelf up here, I have an old two-track reel-to-reel machine. <laughs> There's still a tape on it, actually. Can't remember which one. And I've got boxes of reel-to-reel tapes, two-track. And one of the things I have, I recorded off of uh, KMET, which at the time was one of the two biggest rival rock stations in Los Angeles, KLOS being the other one right next to it. And then way on the other end of the dial was K West, K W S T who actually used to play full sides of tales from topographic oceans. But going back to KMET, um, that year, I think had to be 75 or 76, uh, Jim Ladd before he got syndicated and did bigger stuff. Jim Ladd interviewed Chris and Nikki talking about the album talking about him being in Yes, talking about being a married couple with a big rock star and just the whole, that whole family dynamic and everything. I still have that. I don't know if the machine even works anymore, but that recording I'm sure by now is on YouTube. It's a great interview. You know what? I apologize. It was 1980. I remember it was 1980, uh, right before or after drama came out. I remember this because I remember finding out his age at the time and he was 33 so that would have been 1980 
Oh yeah, it is on YouTube. Over it is. The, oh, that's yes, great. Yeah, I can't wait to at, listen to that. Yeah, over at Yes Source, which has a bunch of these things. Good for them. them. That's awesome. And 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 folks and Stephen, raise your hand if you've watched what I call the director's cut of Fish Out of Water, where Chris basically gives commentary and he's on camera most of the time. Oh yeah, one of our uh, viewers, Dave Dreyfus, over on Drum Talk TV, uh, brought it up just. Oh, now. that's great! Thanks, yeah. Dave. That that is a great thing to hear him talk about years later, twenty, thirty years later, whatever it is, about recording it and thinking back, and you could tell it wasn't like he didn't really prep for it. It's like off the top of his head, and he's trying to remember. It's yeah. great storytelling because it's so natural. Thanks, Dave, for bringing that up too. Yeah, it, it is kind of awkward to watch because it's the camera's like on him for most of the time, and it's it's one thing if it's intercutting between different things, but it doesn't cut to the promo vid as much as you well, would think. And they didn't have a lot um, to work with though to cut away too. Right. Yeah, it was just those first two songs, but yeah, it's a cool thing to see. Um, I don't know if it was just me, but I feel like they could have mixed it better so that the music wouldn't sound too loud compared to the commentary. Oh uh, yeah. Th there is some interesting stuff in there. And it also has that interview I mentioned. So yeah, yeah people should definitely check that out. Cool. Any other people chiming in on where this album ranks for them for yes member solo albums? Right. Yeah, Let us know folks. Know. Yeah. And um, the singles uh, at this time that we know of, like there were single versions, like single edits of Silently Falling and Lucky Seven. Uh, the one for Lucky Seven is actually on Bill Bruford's new box set, Making a Song and Dance. Right. But for Silently Falling, before listening to the single edit, I was like, how, how did they cut this down to a single, like with everything that goes on in it? Yeah, it's um, 11 and a half minutes, essentially. Yeah, like it basically starts with the, um, it's um, like almost three minutes long, this single edit. But it, yeah, it basically just jumps into the meat of it with like all the instruments together, basically, and then just fades out as it goes along. Um, and Lucky Seven does a cool fade out where it makes sense too, I would say. And, and then Safe, to me, feels very different from other really long tracks that I enjoy. And that Safe feels to me like an extended outro to the album. And it always surprises me like how long it is. It's almost 15 minutes long. But yeah. Like, as it keeps going, I keep thinking, okay, this is going to be the end of the album. <laughs> or, no, this is the ending. <laughs> like, I don't know if anyone else feels that way. Yeah, that makes sense, actually. It, and it's not that you want it to end. It just it feels like it could be. Right, like it feels like it's ending. Yeah. Um, And, yeah, the, and this got um another re-release in 2018 where – it was like a box set edition with those single edits I mentioned, but also with Run With The Fox and Return Of The Fox mm. added. So in a way, it does have Alan White on it. Uh, That's kind cool. Kind of a cheat, I know. Um, and apparently Peter Sinfield, who was a lyricist on the first four King Crimson albums, yeah. made some suggestions for Safe. I love how I think this might be the only album ever where not just even one, but two people got credited for suggestions. <laughs> or am I wrong? No, Finishing Touches. Two got credited for Finishing Touches. But I've never heard of another album, like Stephen said about Peter Sinfield, where he got credited for suggestions. <laughs> like, what kind of suggestions? Yeah, because... With movies based on novels, if it's like very loosely based on the novel, it'll sometimes have a credit where it says suggested by the novel by Pierre, Pierre Bull or something. Uh, that's Planet of the Apes. But um, yeah, I wonder what those suggestions were. Yeah. Um, 
So they were worthy of being credited, whatever they were. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a few of these questions that we have on our doc to discuss. Okay. Um, we already went through the first one. Um, do you have a favorite song or a couple of favorites on here? I do. I'm going to say hold out your hand and... Probably Lucky Seven. Okay. I love yeah. Silently Falling, though, too. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's definitely... Uh, it's got to be Hold Out Your Hand and You By My Side together, if only mm. for, like... Like, I have a lot of nostalgia, like, listening to those, and they're just so well-written lyrically and well-performed, and, like... This I, I guess what's great about this album is people could be like, oh yeah, all all these songs are in my top five fish out of water songs. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, let's yeah. see what else we got. Yeah. Um, how well does the orchestration work with the overall sound? I think on this album it fits perfectly. I can't even hear it without it. It works that well. Yeah. What's funny is it's closer. In terms of chronology, it is closer to time and a word, but it feels to me more like magnification and how they, how both of those albums handled the or the enhancement by orchestra. It, it's a bigger orchestra. Yeah, it's a bigger orchestra sound, and it's more integrated with the music. Yeah, and it has like similar pacing, whereas with time and a word, the it was kind of more fast paced at certain times. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. It definitely feels like it's essential to the album. Um, and we talked about the promo video already. Um, so here are a few tidbits about like where else music from this album has popped up. So we talked about the 76 tour. Yeah. It also appeared on Conspiracy Live, a DVD that came out in 2006, I believe. Which is uh, partly what we played in the intro. Here's a little tidbit. Yeah. And, and even back then, his first, his voice sounds so good. And it's yeah. years later. Yeah, that version 30. definitely sounds closer to the album in terms of his voice. And you got like Billy Sherwood and Jay Shellen on there as well, I believe. Yeah. Um, when he played it again uh, in 2012 for Bass Player Live, uh, and he had like John Davison uh, singing like vocal harmonies there, and, and I believe Taylor Hawkins was on drums in that performance. But really. For the, yeah, the bass player live uh, performance. Wow, I didn't know ago. that. Yeah, that one, I would say Chris's voice sounds more different, a bit deeper. Like, it's not bad, but the Conspiracy Live version is definitely closer to what we imagine when it comes to the studio version. Um, but yeah, it's well worth watching the bass player live video. I'll drop it in the comments in a moment. And I remember sending you this clip like three years ago or something, but there's a TV show called Good Girls. And in the season two finale, so season two, episode 13, they play a good chunk of You By My Side, which was really surprising to a bunch of us. And I remember I sent you this clip and you asked me questions about the show. like. It, what, did they solve the investigation? I was like, I don't know. I don't watch this show. <laughs> I just watched this clip. And it's interesting because that is an example of a, let's face it, by today's standards or whenever that was. What year was that? What year? Uh, Three. 2019. Okay, so 2019. How obscure is that album, let alone that song for a mainstream popish? TV, so someone must have been a fan and said, I know exactly what's going to go here. I've got it. Just hold on, Mr. Music Director. I've got it. And they played it when they went, Oh, this is great. Who is this? Chris Squire of Yes. Who? Yeah. Th they Just use it. <laughs> yeah, they even edit it so that it ends with the uh, words, Nothing to hide when it looks like there's someone who's hiding something, I think. Yeah. 
Um, like it's not just roundabout or I've seen all the people like that was definitely a deep cut. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Those are expected. They've been used over and over. Sorry. My dog, he's barking. Oh, it's probably trying to sing the song. It is. Yeah. Oh, it's just like having kids again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> right. But, but moving along, um, after Chris's passing in 2015, Cruise to the Edge did a, had a tribute, um, where Neil Morse band with Mike Portnoy, Steve Hogarth, and Pete Trawavas and Jonas Reingold played Hold Out Your Hand and I think You By My Side as well. I'll have to double check that. Um, but yeah, there's like a multi-camera version of this on oh, YouTube. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and it looks pretty good. Okay, yeah, they performed both songs. Um, but later in about 2018, there was that tribute album titled A Life in Yes, the Chris Squire tribute, where Steve Hogarth and Larry Fast did a cover of Hold Out Your Hand. And it's very well produced and well sung, well performed. But again, since it's just that one song, not followed by you by my side, it, it feels incomplete. Like it just me, drops but- off. Yeah, but still well produced and worth like that whole album was such a great listen back in the day. Um, it's so weird thinking of 2018 as back in the day now. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how might working with Yes have influenced uh, Fish Out of Water? I think obviously Chris knew that part of the sound he wanted needed to have Bill Bruford. Cause he reached back, you know, for that. Um, I think also, um, you know, the length that we get, um, with silently falling and, you know, all the changes and stuff like that. But at the same time, he goes completely at the, if you look at what yes was doing at the time, completely opposite with you by my side. You by my side sounds very, and people don't overreact to this, but compared to what Yes was doing and the rest of this album, it sounds very pedestrian in a way. You know, it's <laughs> it's very happy, ballady. It's almost like a, a peak of what Phil Collins would do much later, which is some piano and singing and. You know what I mean? It just yeah, it's, like, it's kind take of take a look at me now. That, that yeah, really it's just so song. way out of place, but yet his voice is so good. And you mentioned earlier the lyrics and just the the melodies. It's it's really a beautiful song, but is so far removed from what they were doing or had done for a long time. You know? Yeah. Um, and I wonder. I go back to also wondering if Hold Out Your Hand influenced a church organ sound on Awaken in any way. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I definitely feel like his experiences on this album could have affected future Yes experiences. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, and I mean, even just the lead vocal thing, like we got later stuff like Can You Imagine on Magnification. Yeah, or and, and that's what that reminds me of, here. the beginning of that too. Yeah. Um, I feel like my cop-out answer for this question of how might working with Yes have influenced the, the, these albums is it tends to be that, oh, they were reacting opposite of what they were doing with Yes. Like that's kind of my cop-out answer but um i do think you know it's part yes experiences and part the sin and early like choir experiences i would say like this album definitely does feel like the sum of multiple things that chris had worked with by that point that's true yeah and uh, i guess we kind of answered this next question but how yes is it like how yes does fish well, out of water feel? Uh, i think we have to ask that question and answer it in the context of when it came out and we did kind of answer that if you look at relayer and tails it's nowhere near any of that 
<laughs> in in any way, shape, or form. And I think that's 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 neat. That's what makes it predominantly all all Chris as Chris as opposed to Chris as a yes member. Even right. though there's some fundamental playing that he might use in both, but but the music itself, the compositions are completely far away from what he was doing at the time with Yes. Yeah. Like I mentioned earlier, silently falling is what feels the most yes. Yeah, that's true. These songs. Um, I can't remember if he's answered this or not, but between beginnings and fish out of water, which would you say feels more yes? I think beginnings. Okay. Yeah. And I, I think because... I think because um, you hear a lot of Steve Howe's different stringed instrument sounds that we hear in Yes music up to that point. You know, the different steel guitar, the dobro, a little bit of distortion on it, um, the the Les Paul, the Strat. I mean, he's got, he uses so many guitars and like they all sound familiar. Um, the Volchalia, all these different instruments, uh, the mandolin, his harmony voice, like, oh, yeah, that's that voice that's usually kind of buried back there. To me, it sounds and feels more yes. And it's appropriate to me that Roger Dean did the cover as well. Okay. What and do you to think? To me, I think I'm leaning more toward Fish Out of Water oh, come ever, on. So, <laughs> ever so slightly. Really? Like, I think the maybe part of it is the vocals and uh the addition of i mean i know both these albums have patrick and bill and steve even has alan on his but yeah there's something about some of the instrumentation that feels a bit more yes but there's stuff on here that feels not as yes May maybe part of it is that i'm so familiar with fish out of water that's kind of clouding how i'm judging like it feels familiar like a yes album feels familiar to me so when we did Steve Howe's episode, that totally got me into that album so much that the next week, I, you know, I cooked dinner mostly. The next week, that's the music I put on while I was cooking. I had to just listen to the album every day. I love it. It's, it really was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I took so much time away from this album. It is so good. I'm sure that'll happen with this as well. Uh, but folks, answer these questions as well um we'd love to know your take as well as the following questions do you think chris could have had more of a solo career i me personally so i have two answers for this i think i remember him saying he was thinking about doing something and it never happened i i think chris especially after john not being in the band Chris had was so invested in Yes and had so much say so that he didn't feel he needed to do a solo album. Not that his Yes work was solo album of here's me with oh and I've got Yes with me. That's not what I mean. I I just think he didn't have the sensibility to be dying to do another solo album whereas how many has Steve Howe done? 17, 19? <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> everything from beginnings to, you know, the Bob Dylan tribute, uh, homebrew. He's really gone in all these different directions, which is great because you really learn what a tremendous, tremendously talented musician he is by not putting out six albums that are, like most bands, a progression of the thing before it. They've all shot off in these different directions. Yeah, like Chris did say in the Yes Years documentary, oh yeah, that was my first solo album. I'm thinking of putting out another one next year. And that became the Chris Squire experiment, which eventually evolved into conspiracy. So right. it was more of a duo type of thing. And then uh, years later, he did Swiss Choir, the Christmas album. And he right. was working on more solo stuff, but some of that ended up becoming the Steve Hackett collaboration that the two of them did together. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. You um, know what I just realized? Ah, we blew what? it. What? To really honor Chris, we should have started the episode like 15 minutes late. <laughs> <laughs> um, you got me with that one. 
<laughs> we yeah, could it would have worked. <laughs> yeah. But I, I do think he could have had an interesting solo career if he really wanted to, but he was probably more committed to Yes and some other stuff. Yeah. Um, and his, you know, his, to his credit, is tremendous of a player he was back in 75 and, you know, that era. His playing and talent and skills evolved through the decades as well. Yeah. And I'll, I'll read these comments that uh, people left about the album um, on the various places I posted. But first, I want to ask you, do you know which Yes song was originally considered for Fish Out of Water? Okay, so let me ask for a hint, okay. if I may. Yeah. Is it a song that came out before or after Fish Out of Water? After. Then I'm going to say Parallels. That is correct. Wow, really? Yeah. It just felt right. Yeah, I did not know that. I've never heard this. That that It just felt right. And his voice is very prominent in that as well. He sings lead with John the whole time. Yeah, and like just imagine if Parallels had like orchestration. Can on you it imagine? And... <laughs> yeah, like if that I'm, had... So I am let's... trying to imagine Parallels with orchestration. Yeah, let's pretend that like there's no restrictions on the vinyl, which is part of why I didn't make it on there. Like, where in the track listing would you have put parallels oh, if he could? That's put a it? great fucking question, son. <laughs> um, wait a minute. So, I wonder if that's where the church organ influence came in, because he thought of it around the same time as "Hold Out Your Hand," which has a pipe organ. So that, I didn't even think of that. That totally makes sense. So yeah. I would say, um, first, I'd say first, then the rest of it the way it is. Oh, wow. Because I, I see it as busting out. Then you got that transition into a slower paced song with um, the pipe organ again. So it kind of, there's, okay. it, there's a common thread. What do you think? Where would you put it? I was thinking essentially between sides one and two. So like after silently falling. Before Side one and a half? Seven. Yeah. <laughs> um, although I suppose the argument could be made that the album could end with it, like end on a bang type of thing. I, I love both of those ideas. I see it as a great way for continuity again to start out side two. Because remember, folks, these are sides, not continuous like a CD or a stream side two with a pipe organ again that I like that actually maybe even better because it okay. it kicks it up a notch as well yeah all right so I want to make that mixtape now <laughs> yeah um so uh now for the comments Randall Groves says one of my favorite albums hey Randall thanks for chiming in is that on Jazz Shift or Trump Talk TV uh, I was on, a, on one of these Yes Shift posts. Uh, oh, okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Hope he's listening. Yeah. And uh, Bruce Shamber says, most excellent album. David Wendell says, great album. My favorite Yes solo album. Video version of Release Hold Out Your Hand and You By My Side were awesome. Wish they also did Silently Falling, but I guess you would need more. You would need more as for that. And more film. <laughs> it's a long song. Yeah. That would have been cool though with Mraz on that video. Yeah, Blair de Pape or Pape says my personal fave album of all time. Wow, that's quite the honor. really. So wait, yeah. who was that? Blair de last name is spelled P A P E. I'm not sure how it's pronounced. Oh wow, Blair, are you watching right now? If so, I'd love to know how often you listen to it. Right. Because I, and, you know, I think we all go through, sorry, I just, quick note, I think we all go through phases where we binge on an album or a band's discography or something like that, or even a song where you just got to hear it over and over. I'm curious where that is in his rotation frequency. Yeah. And last one, Ian F. Thomas says, my favorite solo album of the 70s, followed closely by Dave Gilmore's first solo release, What an Era. 
Yeah, I saw that tour by Dave also with Chris Slade on drums and interviewed Chris and talked about that. Quick note, talked about Chris Slade saying he got that phone call, went to the pub and celebrated with his wife, came home, the phone rang again, it was Jimmy Page asking him to join the firm. And he says, oh, I'm sorry, Jimmy, I just jo- signed up for a David Gilmore tour for 18 months. And Jimmy said, it's okay, we'll wait. They waited for him. They wanted him so badly. How cool is that? Yeah. Oh, we got one more comment, like, just now. Okay. S- Steve, second side to music, says, fantastic classic album, one of the best Yes solo albums. Was watching Chris giving a commentary on it last night. Didn't quite finish, but very interesting. Yeah, it's a good watch. Cool. Very cool. Uh, yeah, so do you have any other comments before we close out and wrap up, Dad? Only that, folks, if you're not familiar with the older music from Yes, maybe you're you're young like Steve, but weren't exposed to stuff out of the womb like he was, and you're just not <laughs> familiar with this era of Yes or their solo albums. And even if you are but you haven't heard this stuff in a long time, go back and revisit it. I hate to sound like one of those old guys, but here we go. (laughs) They just don't make music like this anymore. And they really fucking don't, okay? I mean, ever since Close to the Edge, uh, Carnival, uh, Brain Salad Surgery, Dark Side, there will never be music like that again or that good. And I know that's so subjective, but... It, it, enca- it helps to encapsulate an era, uh, like the gentleman said about, you know, also David Gilmore's first solo album com- coming out, what an era. That that says it all right there. Yeah, I-, I would just briefly counter that. I do think good music like this is still made. It's just not as surprising. Co- oh. <laughs> <laughs> not as surprising because, you know, in the 70s, like, that was when people realized, oh, stuff like this could be made. And so we could basically imagine what could be made. Now it's just all down to the execution and the output. You know, that's a good point. It was being born back then, whereas now they're recreating, not recreating history, but they're they're keeping that that alive, basically. You know, the genre, if you will, hopefully. That's subjective right. too. But I get what you mean. Yeah, that that's valid. Yeah, so the next one in this solo album series, we'll we'll get to it on Alan White's birthday uh, in about a month. June 14th. So, yeah, so that'll be ramshackled. That'll be an interesting one. It's quite different from these others. Um, but in the meantime, I believe we're planning another news episode Thursday night at 7 p.m. Pacific. This Thursday, if you're watching us live or watching us before Thursday, the 12th of yeah. May. Yeah. And then I and... want to announce another upcoming episode when you're done and tell people that we'll be posting about it, but to start thinking about it because they, they're going to contribute. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so We've been talking about this one for months, Steve and I, but other stuff keeps popping up. So we're doing other news desk episodes, other features, having guests. We want to do an episode called Yes Tomatoes. (laughs) It's called Yes Tomatoes. And what we want to do, we're going to post about this, and we want people to list one or three or five of their least favorite Yes songs. And then what we're going to do is we're going to sort those out by maybe, I don't know, what would be a true concert set list by Yes, Steve, depending on the songs. I guess it could be 12 to 18 songs. We're going to sort them by how many times they were mentioned. And and then we're going to take those top ones mentioned, and we're each separately going to arrange them into a set list yeah. and see what we come up with with people. I bet there'll be some really great stuff in there. Yeah, that'll be a fun one. So, yeah, go ahead and like get the gears turning in your minds and we'll probably get to that in early June. And and, and you can even write in your answers. If you miss the posts on the uh, yes, shift Facebook page, you can write us at yes, shift podcast at gmail.com. Give us one to five of your least favorite. Yes. Songs. And uh, we'll also, post about it we'll compile everything sort it out rank from most mentioned to least mentioned take the top 
maybe 15 to 20. And then Steve and I will go in our own corners and separately put together a set list and see if any of them even end up in the same slot, let alone what we get. And it'd be fun to make a a mixtape of each of those with bootleg versions, if there's a bootleg version of each song. How fucking cool would that be? Yeah, that'd Yes, be Tomatoes Live. Ooh, I like the sound of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we call it Ripe Tomatoes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. And, of course, you can find all our broadcasts at facebook.com slash yesshift. And you can support us by going to anchor.fm slash yes shift and click the support button, donate whatever you want. Um, and you can find us on various podcast apps. Just do a search of yes shift. You'll probably find us. And we even have a YouTube channel, which I've been trickling stuff onto. Um, I added a couple of videos uh, last week. I scheduled them for a while I was out and yeah, so just find Yes Shift over on YouTube as well, if that's your thing. And uh, yeah, I think we've hit on everything. And uh, yeah, ho- hopefully the end of this doesn't get cut off like last time. Which is yeah, we don't know why that is. Thanks, Facebook. It's a it's a techno thing. Um, you could also follow me on Drum Talk TV, where we broadcast all the Yes Shift yeah. episodes live as well. Um, if you haven't seen us with Bill Bruford, if you haven't seen us with... Mike Tiano, um, if you haven't seen us with brain farting, Oliver Wakeman. Yeah, Adam Sears as well. From Low Bait Scarp. Oliver, I'm taking this on my trip on the 20th through the 26th. I'm going off the grid. Steve just came back from being off the grid. So we didn't do this for, what, a week and a half or something. It was fun to do yeah, this. And yeah. <laughs> we're going to cram like three or eight episodes into the next week before I leave. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, yeah, folks, it, for following. It took yeah. some acclimating, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and remember, chip in. You know, feel free to answer the questions in the in the comments, even if you're watching the archive. And you can write us, like we said, and contribute to that episode that we're building. We're working on some other Yes member guests, as well as some Yes family in the periphery guests. That's coming up soon. Watch for the news announcements. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, I think that'll do it. Um, yeah, we're just basically using this outro in case we get cut off. In case it doesn't cut, in case it does (laughs) cut us off. Yeah. All right. Um, you had a good time visiting your mom? Uh, yeah, I did. It was really great. Yeah. Great. Dog freaked out when you got home? Uh, he was sleeping heavily.